counseling is where my eyes opened. And I developed that self-awareness. And it's an ongoing process, right? We need to all continue to do our own work. We need to have our own counseling. We need to have consultation, supervision, coming to conferences like this where we learn and grow from others and we become inspired. We're an ongoing work in progress. You know, speaking of self-reflection, the other day I, was, I had a moment of insight. I was kind of feeling really self-righteous and a little uh, morally superior when I was saying that, you, you know, I'm not a person who has road rage. I'm just not. And then it occurred to me that that's probably because I cause it. <laughs> right? So. We have to see our blind spots, right? And we've got to continue to do that. Earlier life experiences and how they've shaped and molded us into who we are, and then empower ourselves and our clients to create change. It's like what Dr. Phil says. He says, how's that working for you? You know, we unconsciously recreate what's familiar until we choose something better. And it is our responsibility to choose something better. You know, the first time I was in therapy, my mother starred in the therapy. I talked about her all the time. The second time I was in therapy, I talked about my ex-husband. And it wasn't until I started to talk about myself that my life began to change. Basically, his mother was unable to take care of him. He grew up in orphanages and foster homes. And if this man says this, that's pretty powerful, right? I always say in life, we're each dealt a different hand of hardships and blessings. And sometimes life doesn't seem fair in her dealings. But I really do believe that we're each given the hand with lessons that we need to learn. And it's a choice in how we look at that. And if we can take responsibility for changing that, that can be really powerful multiple interventions, he'd relapse. Eventually she made the very difficult decision to get divorced. And she was like a phoenix rising from the ashes. She returned to the workforce for the first time in 10 years after having small kids. And she looked great, she was working hard, she was doing great. We terminated our counseling and a few months later she called me and she said, hey Joyce, I need a tune-up. And I said, why, what's going on? And she said, well, I started dating again, and the guy that I'm seeing is just like my ex-husband, except that he has an Australian accent, <laughs> right? So we all unconsciously recreate what's familiar. We have patterns in our lives, and we have to think about how those are serving us. And we have to take responsibility for change. I believe that change happens with self-love. In counseling, we may love and care about our clients, and they may take our words and integrate that and begin to love and care about themselves and begin to shift their practices of self-love. I always think that as adults, we have to learn how to be our own good parent. So self-care, I know it's all the obvious stuff, getting enough sleep, making sure we're eating right, exercise, having fun. I also think tending to our dreams is part of self-love taking care of our relationships. And it's a practice, it's a devotion. Is it selfish? Is it selfish, is it narcissistic to practice self-love? No, it is essential. Think about the oxygen mask analogy, we must take care of ourselves before assisting others. I had a problem with detrimental caretaking where I took care of my clients, my staff, my children, to the point where I was exhausted and depleted and resentful and unwell. And I had to make a choice to choose self-love. And that takes a lot of work. Um, it also takes turning down the volume of our inner critic, you know, that voice in our head that tells us that we're not good enough. Um, I, I, I call mine Zelda. She's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> and sometimes I have to say to her, you know what? I've got things to do, places to go, people to see. You've got to get out of my way. Go take a hike, Zelda, because it's not helpful. We need to learn how to become our own compassionate advocate. 
One day I thought, you know, I'm a damn good friend. When, to my friends, I'll have your back. I'll support you. I'll believe in you. I'll affirm you. I'll want the best for you. I'll tell you you can do it. I'll be there to support you in any way I can. And it occurred to me, why the hell am I not doing this for myself? Recently, I had a graduate student who looked very exhausted and depleted. She was taking a lot of hard classes, 25 hour a week internship. I knew she was working on a project in her community. She looked exhausted. And I said to her, if you were a cell phone, what would your battery be at? <laughs> and she said, mm, 1%. 1%. I asked a, a mother of four recently, what's your battery at? She said, three. This is very scary. So I'd like you to think today, check in with yourself and consider what, where's your energy level at? Where's your battery? And we don't get the little red bar like our phones get when we're under 20%. We need to develop that ability to recognize when we're exhausted and depleted and we need to do things that are going to fill our cup so that we can practice self-care and self-love. This is a self-love wheel. So basically, on each spoke is a different aspect of self-love. Unplugging from technology, meditation, moderation of substance use. Are you seeing the doctor and the dentist? Are you practicing self-compassion, self-forgiveness? Those are important skills. Speaking of self-compassion, I had an incident a couple ICA conferences ago where when I was serving as president, I emailed the leadership and I said, come on guys, we really need to get our ducks in a row. And Rana Heinig, the former executive director, replied to me and she said, hey Joyce, I think you made a typo. And I was like, uh-oh. And I looked at it and I had spelled ducks with an I. Oops. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so like we all make mistakes, right? And you gotta laugh at it. You've gotta move through it. Forgive yourself. Stop beating yourself up and move through it. So practicing self-compassion. Or am I sleeping three hours a night? I better put it down here. So you go around the wheel, you complete each spoke and then you connect them. And you can see where you have dents in your wheel. So we don't often assess our self-love, so this exercise is like stepping on a self-love scale. Without the support of our friends and colleagues, we can achieve very little. That's why we need organizations like ICA to go on Days on the Hill, so that we can av advocate as a group and accessing support is something that I think as counselors, we're not super great at, right? We are usually the supporters. We give support very, very easily. I realized when I became exhausted and depleted that I needed to ask for more support. And it's something that I've, I've worked on a lot. A couple months ago, I was asked to give a training that I'd never given before. And I procrastinated and was feeling very stressed out. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna practice what I preach and I'm gonna ask for some support. And I emailed three colleagues and set, who I thought had given a similar presentation or at least knew about the topic. And I said, hey, do you have any support or resources that you could help me on putting together this PowerPoint? Within 30 minutes, I had three full PowerPoints shared with me. It saved me hours of work. And they were happy to help me. I've helped them. We need to ask for that support. Our support network is like a garden. Sometimes we need to nurture it. We need to check in with our friends. We need to make sure we're seeing them, we're talking to them. And sometimes we need to weed it. I had a friend who ironically was a psychiatrist um, and we would get together quarterly for breakfast. And I realized after having breakfast with this friend, I always needed to take an Advil. <laughs> and I thought, why is this? And I thought, you know what, this is not a mutual reciprocal friendship. It was kind of a toxic relationship. 
where she was sharing and I was absorbing, and then I'd come home with a headache. And so I thought, you know what? I need to think about my time and my support network and maybe making room for relationships that lift me up and relationships that are really helping me grow and succeed. And that's something I think we all need to do. I have a friend who said, I think this is really smart. She said, when you think about your support network, think about it as if each person has a menu. And the menu is the kind of support that they can provide to you. So like I have a friend, Shelly, that's a blast to go out with. She's a blast to shop with. Is she the person that I call when I'm having a really hard day? Maybe not. It's my other friend, Sherilyn. She's a counselor. Actually, she's a social worker. <laughs> um, but making sure that we have that support that's going to help lift us up. And help, helping our clients access that support is also important. So I have a support wheel here. Do you have a community that you're a part of? I belong to a yoga studio. I love that community. I love my ICA community. My neighborhood is another community. Communities are important for a sense of support. Do you have health care that is supporting you? Do you have financial supporters, good friends, family? Are people helping you out on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, I have significant other on there. If you don't want a significant other, don't have a significant other, you can cross that out. But seeing how your support network is and completing that wheel, again, can be really helpful. So please consider that for yourself and for your clients. Eckhart Tolle, who I mentioned, said, whenever you feel superior or inferior to anyone, that's the ego in you. I think that's really interesting because I think it's easy to understand ego as feeling better than others, right? It's kind of arrogance or grandiosity, but it's also our egos that make us feel small and inadequate and experience envy or insecurity. And we all have egos. Our egos are part of the human condition. They're the mask that we wear to the world around us. I like to think it's the way our mind identifies who we are. But guess what? I don't think that we are our egos. If you believe in the mind-body-spirit connection, the ego is the mind, and we are the spirit. We are the essence, the essence of us. And true success requires detachment from ego, the ability to, to take that mask off, to be vulnerable, to be authentic, to be real, to realize that we are all equal, and that we are all divinely worthy of all that is great. I think that this Cherokee tale says it best. Maybe some of you have heard it. But there's a Cherokee grandfather, and he's talking to his grandson. And he says, inside of me is a battle. And it's a battle between two wolves. And one is evil. And he represents hatred and anger and jealousy and false pride and lies insecurity, ego, superiority. The other wolf is good. He represents love and humility, benevolence, kindness, compassion, gratitude, forgiveness, faith, and love. And he told the grandson, this same battle is going on inside of you and every single person. And the grandson thought about it for a minute and he said, well, which wolf will win? And the grandfather said, the one that you feed. Detachment is another skill that I think is really important for success. I was once at Target, and the cashier in front of me was being yelled at by the customer in front of me. And the customer was so rude to this cashier, she was like horrible to him. And I watched the cashier, and his feathers didn't get ruffled at all. He was calm, he was cool, he was collected, and he just kept checking her items out and continued to be very polite to her. And when it got to be my turn, I said, I'm so sorry that that woman was so rude to you, and I'm amazed at how you handled that. Like, how'd you do that? And he said, oh, I don't let anyone in my head who isn't paying rent. <laughs> That's a skill, right? That's a skill that we can all develop. And, and to me, that's the, excuse me, that is the skill of detachment. 
So in my own therapy, my own therapist would talk about feelings of waves, feelings in our bodies as waves of emotion. And we can choose to learn how to surf those waves rather than being engulfed by them. And I like the analogy of a lifeguard. If you're a lifeguard, you don't want to be in the pool drowning with the person. You want to have your feet firmly rooted on the ground and be able to throw them that life vest or that lifesaver. And we don't want to be in the pool drowning with our clients. So we need to practice some skills of detachment. I remember years ago, I have two teenage daughters, so I have lots of opportunity for detachment now and <laughs> practicing that. Uh, but I remember when my oldest daughter, Celeste, was three and Claudia was a newborn. And my older sister, Paula, was coming to visit. And Paula is kind of the perfect older sister with the perfect kids, and she's the perfect mom. I mean, to stay in my home with my new baby and my three-year-old. And I was really nervous about it. And it was nighttime, and I was putting Celeste to bed, and she had a total temper tantrum, rolling on the ground, crying, flailing. I was so frustrated and embarrassed. I was like, ah, just go to bed. So I get in a little fight with my three-year-old, which you know never works, it doesn't go well. And I came downstairs embarrassed, and Paula was smiling at me, and she said, oh, you locked horns. You know, you can't do that. You have to detach. And I realize it's like cognitive behavioral therapy, right? It's our thoughts that fuel our emotions and our behaviors. And so I thought, well, what is, what is the belief system that I have about myself when my daughter's rolling on the ground, ha refusing to go to bed? And the belief system is, if she's behaving like that, then I must not be a very good mom. And that's a pretty uncomfortable thought. So it was causing me anger and distress. And so instead, I developed a new mantra. When things like that would happen, I would say, I'm just a human being, I'm doing the best that I can, this moment will pass, I'm a good mom. It was funny, that week I saw a friend of mine at the preschool and she came out with her three-year-old who was temper tantruming and flailing and kicking and she was holding her and she just said, hey Joyce, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, I have a lot to learn, right, about detachment. I had an experience a while ago where I was talking to my friend Randy. And Randy, we were at a holiday party and he said, hey Joyce, how's your book coming along? This mental wealth book is something that I've been working on for a long time. And I said to him, oh man, not so good. Um, I'm you know, still working on it, nothing's happened with it. And he said, oh geez, you need to see my monk. And I said, your monk? And he was like, yeah, my Buddhist monk. And I'm a person who, I, you know, I can get all the help. I'll take all the help I can get. So I made an appointment with his Buddhist monk. And it wasn't quite what I was expecting. He wasn't the Tibetan-looking monk that I was imagining. He lived in Highland Park, which is a nice suburb of northern Chicago. He had just quit his job with Accenture as an executive to focus on his practice. He's wearing a black t-shirt and jeans. And within moments of talking to him, I realized that I was speaking with one of the most intelligent people who I'd ever met. So I was really excited. And he said, tell me why you're here. So I told him about my book, and he listened, and he nodded. And then he wrote something on a piece of paper, and he said, I have your answer. And my heart was beating, and I thought, oh my gosh, what's he going to say? He's going to give me the, the magic secret that's going to help me get my book published. And he handed me the paper, and it said, <laughs> and I was annoyed. I was like, are you being serious? And he said, weaken the fiction. Weaken the fiction that you're telling yourself, this narrative in your head. I believe we are all the author and the protagonist of our own life story. And we can choose to make it different. And I said, I am so impressed with that. And I said, gosh, I've been working on a book for 10 years. 
and I was feeling shame and inadequacy around that, she looked at me and she said, you know, it took me 20 to write one of my books. And I thought, wow, that is, show us how our belief systems fuel those feelings of inadequacy when it's fiction. I, you know, I'm imagining Serena's just popping out books left and right, and I'm struggling. So we've got to weaken the fiction. I love yoga. Um, this is a yoga pose called crow pose. And they say that yoga is meditation with movement. And when I was at the yoga studio, a man came in, and he was from the military, from the Navy, and he was driving a big ship. And he was in town, and he came in to practice yoga. And he told the yoga studio owner, he said, in the military, we practice yoga, but they don't call it yoga. And the instructor said, well, what do they call it? And he said, we call it resilience training. And I believe that about yoga because I've noticed that as I practice, that I, know, that I know that I can breathe through an uncomfortable pose knowing it will pass. The discomfort will pass, and in the end, I will be stronger and more flexible and more strong. And, or strong, flexible, and open, balanced. And it translates to your mental attitude. It's helped me a lot with anxiety, by the way. But this crow pose, I used to, when I was in a class and people would do it, I used to say, I can't do crow pose. I can't do that pose. And then I thought about weak in the fiction. What, that's an, something I'm telling myself. So I, I did it one arm at a time, and then I kind of faked it, and then I face planted a few times, <laughs> and then I did it. That's me. <laughs> right? I didn't think I could do that. I was telling myself I couldn't do it. I can do it. Um, you know, that photo was taken very quickly, but I can do it. <laughs> I can do it. And I believe that it is our challenges that help us develop resilience. I once read that resilience happens when there's high trauma and high support. So when we have high challenges, big challenges in our lives, if we access enough support, we can come out way stronger. I had this in my business. So Urban Balance, when I started it, I started it with $50,000 of debt and $500 cash, and chose to be insurance friendly and be in network with every insurance plan. People told me I was crazy because you get lower rates per session. And it was okay in the beginning when the insurance company only owed us a couple thousand dollars at a time. It was not okay when Urban Balance grew and we had hundreds of thousands of dollars outstanding in claims. I'm embarrassed to admit that there was a time that I could barely pay my therapist. I could barely pay my rent. I was late on payments sometimes. I had a lot of shame about it, a lot of feelings of inadequacy, and I refused to get business or financial help because I was afraid. I was afraid that somebody would tell me that my dream business wasn't gonna work out and that I'd need to fold. And I stuck my head in the sand and I had a really big loss. My business partner, who was one of my best friends, emailed me and said she couldn't take the stress of it anymore and was out. And she never came back. And many of our therapists left. And many of our clients left because they were like, what the hell's going on? There's some financial problems. One of the owners just left. It was a dark day. I learned so much in that moment because I felt like the captain of a ship. I, I, I would go down with the ship. I was prepared to file business bankruptcy if I could, but I believed in urban balance. And I had staff working for me and clients that were depending on the company. And so I ate a piece of humble pie. And I opened myself up to humility. And instead of telling the staff, you know what, I've got this. Everything's going to be fine. I said, I am so sorry. And I messed up. And I need help. And once I said, I need help, help came out of the woodwork. 
people were more than willing to help. My staff was like, yeah, we, we love it here. We want to help you. And I had a neighbor who said to me, Joyce, you need a business valuation. So I didn't know what that was, but he said, go talk to my CPA and he'll help you. And I remember I went, I had my QuickBooks file, my hands were shaking, I was crying. And he crunched the numbers and he said, Joyce, you, you, your, your business model works. You truly have a cash flow problem and I can help you get the right lending so that you can pay your therapist on time. And he helped me crunch the numbers and together with the leadership team, we turned the ship around. When I sold Urban Balance last year, we were grossing over $5 million a year. And I could never done that without the support and help of others and asking for that help. And now that I've been through tough things like that, I've lost both my parents, I've been through tough things. Now I know it's that Eleanor Roosevelt said, you never know how strong a woman is until you put her in hot water. She's like a tea bag. And I think that's true. We, those hard experiences provide resilience. And they help us know we can survive other things. Think about our clients. Aren't you awed and inspired by the resilience of the human spirit? Compassion. Empathy is the magic wand in counseling and in relationships. I had a client once who, I had a rift in our relationship. We were doing some deeper work and I said something that really hurt her feelings. And we needed to process that and work on that. And I apologized and we processed it and I empathized with her feelings. And she looked at me and she said, you know what, Joyce? I think that you are my first healthy relationship. And sometimes we are that for people, right? Through compassion and the ability to step out of our own stuff and be there for others. So thinking how you can use compassion to help your work as a counselor. Vision. How many of you have made a vision board? I love vision boards. I make one every year. I encourage you to make one for both personal and professional. I'm a big believer in work-life balance. I named Urban Balance because I felt my highest role was as a mother, but I love my work as a counselor, and I wanted a career where I could see clients during school hours and be home with my family during the evenings and the weekends. We have to develop that vision, and again, that belief that it is possible. We have to think something is possible in order for it not to be impossible. I had a lot of people tell me, when I started, I was 24 years old, said, you're too young, there's too many therapists in Chicago, you can't only see clients during the daytime, you can't only take insurance. And I respectfully chose not to believe them and to forge ahead. And it's that tenacity, I think, that is an ingredient for success. Refusing to give up and get it, trying again and again. So with my book publishing, my book has been rejected by 20 publishers. I'm still working on it. But now I act as if. And I walk around and I say, I am a Hay House author and speaker. And the more that I, I believe in self-fulfilling prophecy, the more you believe it, the more the universe is going to respond to that. So again, we are the authors of our own life story. How do you want it to be? We see clients who have that external locus of control and their life goes where the current takes them. And we need to help empower them to grab their oars and map out where they want to go. What's working for them? What's not working for them? What do they want to change? And I believe we set our own ceilings. So dream big, have a big vision. My best friend accuses me of psychotic optimism. But refusing to believe that something is impossible helps make it possible. So having that vision is so important. This is something that I'm extremely passionate about, abundance. I mentioned earlier that I don't believe that self-care is selfish. I believe it's essential. One of the things that drives me nuts about our profession is when people say I wouldn't go into, into it for the money. You know, obviously we didn't come in this profession to make millions. That bothers me. 
And it bothers me because what we do is very important. It's very important, meaningful, helpful work. And we deserve prosperity. Money is not a bad thing. And actually, when we have money, we're able to help more. You know, as Urban Balance grew, I was able to serve in volunteer positions. I was able to give, I, each staff member chose a charity that they wanted, and we would give money to that charity. Able to offer services on a sliding fee scale or sometimes even pro bono. You can't do that when you're struggling, right? So we need to value ourselves as a profession. And that doesn't, that's not uncaring. It's caring about ourselves and valuing ourselves. When I first graduated, the starting salary for a counselor was $18,000 a year in 1996. And I thought, woo, that's going to be tough. I have $50,000 of student loans. And I heard someone got a $25,000 salary right out of school. And I said, I, I want that. I want to make $25,000. So I did. I got a job and made $25,000 a year. I worked at a methadone maintenance clinic. Um, and then, I thought, you know what, I need to be able to pay my bills. I need to make more money. And so I set in my mind that I wanted to make $35,000 a year. So I worked for an employee assistance program and I made $35,000 a year, but not more. And then I started my private practice and I met with my friend Steve, who was also starting his private practice. And he said, hey Joyce, how much money do you want to make? This was 1996. And I said, I would really love to make $60,000 a year. Actually, it was 1998. $60,000 a year. And he said, 60? He said, oh, I, I want to make over 100. And I said, oh, like, do you think that's possible? And he said, of course it's possible. And that year, I made 60, and Steve made over 100. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, am I setting my own ceilings? Yes. We do this, we set our own ceilings. And so I started expanding my thinking about money. And my own counselor said to me, she said, Joyce, what does money mean to you? What do you think of when I say money? And I said, oh, stress. My dad was born in the Depression era. I spent much of my childhood with him unemployed and tremendous financial anxiety. And so money equals stress. And she said, well, of course you make it go away then, right? If you think it's stressful, can we reprogram that? What's your belief? So I shifted it to money as a resource, and I am deserving of that resource. And my life changed. And we can do this for ourselves, we can do this for our clients. I believe in negotiation. I attended a seminar at Kellogg about negotiation, and it was for women, and they said, statistically, women don't negotiate. I found this as an employer. Many people don't negotiate. You offer a salary, and people say, yes, thank you. There's always a range. You got to ask for more and be creative and value yourself. And I've started negotiating for anything that I can. When I was signing leases for Urban Balance, an easy thing to ask for was we needed a lot of filing cabinets. And when businesses fold, they often leave filing cabinets in large office buildings. And the office buildings, the property managers don't need those. So I would ask for free filing cabinets. Didn't cost them anything. They would throw them in. They're, they would have cost me $1,200 a piece. So just learning how to negotiate that. I realized lately I've been spending a lot of money at the salon. I shouldn't say that. My husband is here filming. Um, <laughs> But I thought, you know what? I learned that the owners give a lot of trainings for their staff. And I thought, why don't I volunteer to give some trainings for them in exchange for some services? So getting creative about how you can welcome prosperity in your life. I had a funny thing several years ago where I had my first out-of-state keynote. And I had no idea what to charge for it. So I asked my friend Ross. I said, what do you charge for an out-of-state keynote? And he gave me his rate. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to borrow his self-esteem, and I'm going to say that right. And I did. And the company said, no problem. And I called Ross back, and I was like, yay, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I'm getting paid that amount of money for speaking for 45 minutes. And he said, 
45 minutes? I gave you my full day rate. <laughs> So just believing you're worth it can have a tremendous impact. I didn't know. So shifting your thinking about money. This quote from Dr. Joyce Brothers is, is good. Success is a state of mind. In order to be a success, you must first think of yourself as a success. My brother likes to say that he's Dr. Joyce's brother, which is cute. <laughs> Even though I'm not a doctor, it's, it's still kind of cute. But so thinking about what is your relationship with money how are you feeling about your profession? Here's my last wheel for you. And this is a professional satisfaction wheel. And while you're here at the conference, you could look at this and consider how are you feeling about your work? And how is it supporting you? Because we need to make sure that our wheel is full so that we don't get burned out right, with our clients. So making sure that you're having the professional development, the mentoring, the connection to colleagues, that you're doing work that's meaningful, that you're learning new skills. So find that together at this conference. And please, again, take these wheels and share them with your clients and anybody who you think might benefit from them. I want to thank you so much for having me and letting me share with you my thoughts on the keys to success and mental wealth. I wish you a fantastic conference, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.